This meeting is being recorded. Hi, I would like to welcome everyone to this event organized by the International Society on General Relativity and Gravitation to honor Yvonne choquet uh, on the occasion of her 100th birthday. Um, I would only like to remind you that uh, the society was first created as a committee in uh, 1959, and it only became the International Society on General Relativity and Gravitation in 1972. And Yvonne was one of the very first members. I think she joined the society in 1965. Um, she, of course, received many honors and accolades during her career. Um, and among the many, she was also president of the society between 1980 and 1983, uh, right after Peter Bergman and before Dennis Shaman, if uh, I'm not mistaken. Um, I would like uh, David Garfinkel to briefly introduce the speakers that we have today. We have three eminent speakers who are very familiar with their work, and I will let David introduce them very briefly, and then we, we will start the event. Welcome, everyone. Um, okay, so welcome everyone. Thanks for uh, for joining us. Um, I want to uh, actually um, subversively sneak in um, on behalf of another organization. Um, one other honor that that uh, Yvonne uh, has has um, had. So um, uh, on behalf of the American Physical Society, I want to mention that that Yvonne uh, jointly with Jimmy York is the recipient of the Danny Heineman Prize uh, for Mathematical Physics. And um, I'm sure I'll leave it to the speakers to uh, to discuss um, the many other achievements of Yvonne, most notably um, her uh, work on uh, the initial value formulation. Um, our first speaker, we're very happy to have uh, Lydia Bieri. Um, so Lydia uh, got her PhD from ETH um, in 2007, working with Krista Dulu. Um, working on um, stuff involving the initial value formulation um, in the full nonlinear case um, for metrics of slow descent. Um, in the ensuing years, she's done um, more work on that subject and also uh, quite a lot of work on uh, gravitational wave memory. Um, she's one of those uh, people who's um, sufficiently uh, versatile um, in both physics and mathematics, um, that uh, she's a fellow of both the American Physical Society and the American Mathematical Society. Um, Lydia is a professor of mathematics um, at University of Michigan um, and um, was until recently the director of their Center for Applied Interdisciplinary Mathematics. Um, but luckily, um, she's no longer the director, which means that she has much more time to concentrate on generating new results in, in mathematics and physics. So uh, Lydia, um, please uh, share your screen and begin your talk. So thank you very much for this very kind invita uh, introduction. So thank you very much also for uh, giving me the honor to talk about some of the works uh, that Yvonne Jocquebria has done. So obviously, um, she, Yvonne, is one of the great players in general relativity. Uh, we will hear a lot about uh, especially her pioneering work on, on the initial value problem, but also so many other aspects. So here is a photo of 2006 of Yvonne um, that was taken in Oberwolfach that the mathematicians at least and some of the physicists know where we go and talk about research once in a while. And let me briefly maybe just say what I would like to focus on. I'll, I'll say a few words about Yvonne's life. I mean, both her life and her work is so rich and many wonderful things can be said that I mean, it's too short, so I highlight certain things just out of um, her life and her work. I'll concentrate saying something about the 1952 paper, and I'm sure Sergio will continue with some more details, but I want to tell you something about maybe the mathematical aspect, but also the physical implication, and in particular, what it means for gravitational waves and doing an initial value problem in physics. So gravitational waves is one of the focuses um, on, on which we will look at this work. And of course, I'll say a few words about some of the later works she has done. So Yvonne turned 100 years at uh, on December 29th of last year. 
Uh, let me say a few words at the beginning. So Yvonne was born as the second of three children in France, in Lille, and Lille is the city very north to in France, very close to the Belgian border that you, hopefully you can see here at the northern border here in France. And um, her father was Georges Pouillard, her mother Berthe Hubert, and the family moved to Paris when Yvonne was two years old. So there was a, um, I have had the pleasure to meet Yvonne in person a few times and have wonderful discussions about math, physics, but also life. And um, if you haven't done so, I recommend reading her memoirs and autobiography, which is really fascinating from, from all kinds of aspects. So what, what was interesting is that her family was really um, um, embedded into science. Science was a part of family discussion all the time. Um, so her mother, Berthe Hubert, taught literature and philosophy. Her father, Georges Hubert, was a physicist, and he became the vice director of the École Normale Supérieure, the ENS, in the mid-1930s. So both parents supported Yvonne's interest early on and also her education in mathematics and physics. Georges Pruyat, so this is maybe the very sad chapter, which also had a big impact in Yvonne's life. Georges Pruyat was deported by the Nazis to a concentration camp in 1944, and he died in a, in a, in a different camp in 1945. So you can imagine how big a shock that was, and I'm leaving out really large part of family history here, but... It was certainly influential for Yvonne that her father was a, a physicist and her parents were really very supportive of math and physics education along the way. So Yvonne um, graduated from the École Normale de Jeunes Filles, the e, um, so to say the ENS for women at the time. So one has to say that women and boys, um, the education was mostly, uh, at least at that level, not together. So there was a special chapter of the ENS for women. She graduated from there in 1946, and um, she had met Leray in 1947, and she had met Lichnerowitz along the way. And at the time, it was not usual for fe um, female students to pursue a career in research. So most often they became teachers, they got a, a degree um, maybe in math or physics and became teachers. And so Lichnerowitz, it's an interesting uh, recount that Yvonne uh, told us and she describes in, in her memoirs that when Lichnerowitz asked her, what do you, uh, would like, what would you like to do uh, with your career? And then, um, so she said something, yeah, well, maybe become a teacher. And so, but he said, well, you would be able to do research, wouldn't you be uh, liking to do research? And she said, yeah, if I could. And so she, uh, Andre Lichnerowitz then um, uh, suggested that she becomes a research uh, graduate student with her, which she did. And she graduated then with Andre Lichnerowitz in 1951. So a nice story. She was one of the first female researchers um, graduating there with uh, going into research at the time. So um, Jean Leray was a good mentor and friend during all these times. Um, maybe let me just point out a few more important facts. I'm leaving out the lot, obviously. In 47, Yvonne married uh, Léon Souret. They had a daughter who was born, Michelle, in 1950. And in 19, uh, the marriage was divorced later on. Yvonne married then Gustave Choquet. And they had a son, Daniel, together, who was born in 62. And her daughter, their daughter, Genevieve, was born in 1966. And here we see a, um, a picture of happy days of Gustave Choquet and Yvonne choquet of 1974. And something I really like, uh, having talked to Yvonne, she talks about her family, embeds it into her work, and um, all is kind of a nice flow. And in her memoirs, also she talks about happy travels of the family with the kids together. So I, I, I was very impressed by that. So, I mean, uh, one chapter that is interesting uh, uh, is that Yvonne and her um, and Leons had postdoc positions in Princeton during the time Einstein was there. And Yvonne had met Albert Einstein after her, she just had completed her, her thesis. And one aspect of her thesis that I will talk about, uh, the 1952 work basically, is that gravitational waves exist and propagate at the speed of light in the fully nonlinear theory of the Einstein equations. And um, Einstein was so happy about it that he said, well, she could always come to knock at his door and, and talk to him. So there was an interesting encounter between uh, Schoke Bruyard and Einstein. So in 79, here is a few things that happened. She, Yvonne, became the first woman to be elected to the French Academy of Sciences. 
And as uh, David already mentioned, she got in 2003 the Danny Heinemann Prize for mathematics, mathematical physics. And in 2015, that's maybe one of the biggest honors uh, one could uh, achieve. Yvonne received the Grand Croix de l'Ordre National de la Légion d'Honneur. So this is the Grand Cross of the National Order of the Legion of Honor. So the highest recognition that you can get in France. She's also an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So one feature that I think is really important to point out uh, in Yvonne's character, whatever happened, it may have been personal life or also in, in work, difficult situations to deal with. She always went through difficulties through a constructive solutions, just working hard at the problem, not having grudges, working hard, go on and, and be open to, to different ideas and other people. So I think that's one of the main strong characters that I, I have always been impressed with. So it's clear to say that Yvonne paved the way for many women in math and science, especially if you think about the pioneering days. So many walls had to be broken through and we are uh, broken through and we profit from this nowadays. She was an, she has been always, she an, has been an inspiring researcher, teacher, and certainly person. So I'm gonna talk about now more the um, work aspects, obviously. I just wanted to say something really important for Yvonne is and has been always human beings. So, I mean, she's always been interested in what people do and, and hear also from students what they are working on. So this is, this has always been wonderful. So let's focus now on the Einstein equations. When you see them in this nice form, geometric form, there's no way to understand at the first look, how should you do an initial value problem? Like in math and physics, we would like to understand what is the system, what does the system, maybe a galaxy, et cetera, look like at the moment? So will this, how will that develop in the future under the Einstein equations? Will there be singularities, black holes, et cetera, or stability questions of certain uh, um, galaxies? All these kind of things we'd like to understand. So we've, one thing is you need to write down initial value problem. So the Einstein equations in this form were written down by Albert Einstein in 1915, and it took quite a long time until um, mathematicians and physicists figured out how to do an initial value problem. So what um, there, there are many people like Darmois, Lichnerowitz, Leray, Sobolev, Schauder, etc., who worked on certain aspects and so uh, Darmois and Lichnerowitz have done some work in the 20s and 90s. So uh, Darmois in particular realized that the Einstein equations couple into a set of initial constraint equations that the initial data has to satisfy, and then a set of hyperbolic evolution equations. So Darmois um, realized also that you can write the metric as I indicated here, where n of t and x is the lapse function and n i here is the shift vector. So, but this is all in the analytic case. So we have infinite uh, differentiation. And Lichnerowitz also in the analytic case looked at the Cauchy problem uh, for, for these um, for the Einstein equations. Now we have a constraint and evolution part. So, so just to summarize for a, a Cauchy problem, we would like to have initial data set that's typically a three-dimensional Riemannian manifold with a Riemannian metric here, G bar, a symmetric two tensor K. And if we have different matter fields like electromagnetic fields, we also have to specify, of course, uh, data and equations for that. So we have a system of equations. And um, this initial data is assumed to be smooth enough. Now, this is going to be a, a big question. First questions were done in the analytic case, which do not allow to see gravitational waves. So we would like to have finite differentiability to see propagation of waves. Nowadays, we do things in good Sobolev spaces usually, but so this is going to be a question, what does um, smooth enough mean? So, and then we solve the Einstein equations, the evolution equations to get a development um, of which is going to be our solution, um, either locally or globally. So that's the hope. So here are the constraints. They also, Darmois pointed out in the analytic case that the constraint equations propagate and then Schocke-Priar showed that actually in the fully nonlinear case. I will not play, plan to stay too long here with the evolution equations, uh, but go on to some of the questions. So the questions before 1952 were, how do we uh, formulate an initial value problem for the Einstein equations for a realistic physical situation? So not analytic, but a physical situation. Does causality hold? How does that work? Do gravitational waves exist in the full uh, theory? And what about finite speed of propagation, et cetera? So, all of these questions got answered 
in this result. So this is one formulation for the Einstein vacuum case. So um, Yvonne Choquet-Briard at the time, Fouret-Briard in 52, showed the following theorem. So let us take initial data as we just described, a, a Riemannian initial metric uh, G bar and the second metric or a symmetric two form K. So this initial data had set is satisfying the vacuum constraint equations in the so-called wave gauge. Then there exists a space time locally in time satisfying the Einstein vacuum equations where H is gonna be embedded in M as a space-like surface, G bar and K the first and second uh, fundamental form. Then the Lorentz symmetric G in wave gauge depends continuously on the initial data. Its value at the given point depends only on the past of P and this solution is actually unique. So that's one formulation. So Yvonne uh, used finite differentiability. So the data was in C5 for G bar and C4 for K. Um, so we're gonna just say something about that. Today, usually we use Sobolev spaces. So we wanna uh, use energy estimates and not lose any derivatives. So what's um, the story with the CK class? The CK class of initial data gives a loss of one degree of differentiability in the evolution. So that's, first of all, um, what you would like to do is to have some energy estimates or norms that don't lose derivatives. So the solution to that uh, today is to use Sobolev spaces with some finite uh, energy norms. Um, the energy estimates, they were done energy estimates by Schauder first in some other different simpler equation that was employed. Lorrain in 53 used energy estimates for quasi-linear hyperbolic systems. And this, um, a bunch of work by Sobolev on this topic in the 50s and 60s by Dion. And then later on, so Fisher, Marston, Hughes, Cato, Marston, etc. So they improved the original result of 52 using uh, energy methods. So let me maybe briefly say something about the proof, but very briefly. So the really genius idea was actually to use wave coordinates. So Yvonne Jacques-Briard used wave coordinates in this proof. And in wave coordinates, the Einstein equations can be written as what I call here number seven, as a set um, uh, of what as wave equations. So we get a quasi-linear wave equation here on the right-hand side. This only depends up to the quadratics in the first derivative of the metric. So we have a quasi-linear wave equation and she was able to solve that. Her first technique that she used um, involved the Kirchhoff-Sobolev parametric. So it was kind of a um, hard thing to do at the time, but um, so that was the main first proof. And the important thing we have now, a nice uh, hyperbolic system that we can solve. So a, a big breakthrough. So one of the big breakthroughs is really we have one way now to do an initial value problem for the Einstein equations. Anything you do will really build on, on such a local existence and uniqueness result. But on top of that, and maybe one of the most important impacts is this proof also um, showed that gravitational waves exist in the fully nonlinear theory and they, uh, they propagate at the speed of light. So we have um, causality and we have finite propagation of, um, of the gravitational field. Remember, Albert Einstein found in 1916 and 18 in two papers solution. He looked at linearized solutions of his equations and found wave solutions. And he realized, oh, that's interesting. But he also realized, well, if it's there in the linearized theory, I'm not sure it should be there in the nonlinear theory. So he would really, he was really in interested in seeing a result about the nonlinear case, which he um, was happy to do, to see that Yvonne did that in her um, in her paper, and that was this nice conversation that Yvonne and Einstein had at the time in Princeton. So she was the one to prove yes. In the nonlinear case, gravitational waves exist and they have a finite speed of propagation. And well, there's a lot of studies in terms of gravitational waves happened later on, especially in 1950s and 60s with Bondi, uh, Metzner, Sachs et al. I'm not gonna go through all of that, but so in the physics community, maybe uh, things got really settled down a little bit more in the 1950s and 60s with, with all these works about gravitational waves. So nowadays, let me say that um, this work by um, Schuke Priya is really important, not only for um, mathematical, let's say, uh, games, but really to discuss physical objects, physical initial value problems, and also um, talk about uh, gravitational waves. 
So there are many people like Thibault and uh, Luc Blanchet and other people um, who have contributed here, uh, especially, I'm not gonna talk about that. I think Thibault is gonna talk a bit about numerical uh, solutions, but Yvonne's actually work inspired also uh, the numerical relativity community, so many, or the post-Newtonian community. So it's very important that many of these works build on her 52 paper. So gravitational waves, as we know, they propagate now at the speed of light. We have this big breakthrough that happened in 2015, where these waves were detected for the first time by LIGO. So <clears throat> since then, LIGO and the colla uh, other collaborations have seen binary black hole, binary neutron star mergers, and I think we are at the beginning of something new. And all this work has always only been uh, possible because we understand first the mathematical problem, the physical implications, and and many people have built on that. So here, Yvonne Jean-Cabriot's work is really fundamental in understanding many of these aspects. So maybe I'll jump here a little bit. So of course, her uh, general work was about a more general set of hyperbolic equations, but maybe I'll say something else here a little bit. So she considered actually a larger class than only the Einstein equations in the original work, but let me maybe, uh, we don't have too much time to talk about that. Instead, I would like to concentrate. Yvonne has done many of the extensions of, of her work by herself or in collaboration. You can extend her um, 52 work to matter fields of many of all kinds, of many kinds. Like she did, for instance, she looked at the Anson Maxwell case. Uh, she in uh, she generalized everything to higher dimensions. She looked at Einstein and perfect fluids or Einstein with charge fluid and zero conductivity. They are still Leray hyperbolic. Uh, if you relax things a little bit, so if you have a charged fluid coupled to Einstein with in the infinite conductivity, then um, you already lose some of that, or you have a charged fluid with finite conductivity. So this is not going to be strictly hyperbolic in the Leray sense, but in a wider class of the so-called leray oya hyperbolicity. So there's an interesting difference. You can general, general, generalize things, but still get a nice Cauchy result out of it. So she looked at Einstein Vlasov and Young Mills. Uh, maybe before I stop, I think I'm running out of time, just a few more, maybe two more minutes. Of course, you ask, what about the global problems, right? So she also, of course, um, had this work with Garage where they show a, a global result that, yes, if you have the corresponding initial data satisfying this, uh, this constraint equations, you have a unique globally hyperbolic maximal space time that you get out of this. And the question here is now, what about the properties of these space times? There could be singularities or stability. That took another few decades until um, Sergio Kleinerman and Dimitri Christodoulou proved her global solution of nonlinear stability of the Minkowski space, where you show if your data is initial data in good weighted Sobolev sp um, uh, spaces, then you create the global solution, which does not have any singularities, but is um, complete uh, space time tending to Minkowski at infinity along any geodesic. So this was generalized by many people. So by Sipser in the Einstein Maxwell case, I generalized this for the Einstein vacuum case in the following setting in 2007. So this is just the initial data setting of the Christodoulou Kleinerman uh, case and, and my generalization. So maybe I go ahead. <clears throat> I'm not gonna talk too much about some of the other implications because I think Sergio will pick up on that in a moment. So one thing I'd like to mention is also a big breakthrough by Christodoulou in 2008 about the formation of black holes. So out of some kind of dispersed situation through the focusing of gravitational waves, you can form a black hole. There are many results that build directly on the local existence and uniqueness proof of 52, uh, maybe in some modified versions, but many of these results, all of these results start somewhere in, in, in Yvonne's proof. So we all stand on Yvonne's shoulders in, in some sense. So maybe the last minute I think I have. So we have, I would like to mention another type of work on strong high frequency waves. So Yvonne has looked at all kinds of wave problems. She um, introduced a method also to deal with that. So a strong high frequency gravitational wave is a, uh, a Lorentzian metric of the following form, where on the right hand side, g bar is some non oscillatory part, and then you introduce oscillations at here first and second order. So, our omega here is the frequency that you look at. And so, this new solution or this metric solves the Einstein equations up to some order. 
And this is this was has been really interested interesting to start study and solve many kinds of problems. And so let me mention maybe here for the sake of time the latest one by Tuati. There's been work by Uno, Luke, Rotniansky, but Tuati just had a recent result extending Yvonne's 69 proof. He constructs high frequency solutions to Jansen vacuum equations without any symmetries, assumptions. And in the limit, he gets a family that approaches a fixed background, which is the Einstein null, null dust system. So this back reaction uh, comes in and that this work has been generalized. All right, so I'm finishing here. So Yvonne has done so much in math, physics. She has been a great contributor and connector of the field. And among this, she has written so many books. And one book was together with her friend, Cecile Dewitt, uh, um, the two women, Cecile and Yvonne here at the IHUS. And I thank Chris Dewitt for this nice picture that um, was uh, shared with us. And there's only one thing to say. I mean, happy birthday, joyeux anniversaire, Yvonne. And I'm so happy and grateful to have been able to discuss math and physics with you. And I hope many of you have um, the pleasure to delve into her work and see, uh, enjoy the physics and math that um, she has done and given us along the way. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Lydia, for that wonderful talk. That was great. Um, so let's see, our uh, next speaker um, is uh, Thibaut Damour. So uh, Thibaut, maybe you can um, start uh, sharing your screen and I'll uh, introduce you. Yes. Um, okay, so uh, we're very happy to uh, have uh, Thibaut Damour here to uh, give the next talk. Um, so Thibaut um, is an emeritus professor at the Institut des Hautes Etudes Scientifiques. Um, and um, to the extent that there has been a consistent um, thread of his research uh, throughout, um, it's basically been um, finding um, uh, the motion of objects in general relativity with sufficient accuracy that you can compare to observation. And um, there have been, um, so this this is a, a um, massive body of work requiring lots of skill and persistence. And um, it's had sort of two stages. Um, the early stage in collaboration with Luc Blanchet, um, where uh, Thibault has, has um, use the post-Newtonian framework um, to a uh, very high order. Um, and then um, uh, the second stage in collaboration with Alessandro Bonato, in which they've developed this beautiful, effective one-body approximation um, that um, allows us to figure out not only the early stages, but also intermediate and late stages for binary black holes. Um, this work has been um, uh, recognized with uh, lots of awards for Thibault and, and his collaborators, including the Prix Paul Langevin, the Albert Einstein Medal, the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics, the CNRS Gold Medal, um, the Dirac Medal of the ICTP, and the uh, Balzan Prize. Um, so uh, Thibault, uh, please uh, go ahead and, and start your talk. Thank you, David. So I want to talk about Yvonne as a mathematician in Einstein's universe. Ah, no, let me, yes. So um, I will give a brief introduction after the uh, very nice talk by Lydia uh, of some of the many fundamental contributions to both the mathematical and physical understanding of Einstein's theory of gravitation by Yvonne. Uh, I will talk about um, her work on the 3 plus 1 decomposition, on solving the constraints of the Cauchy problem, not the evolution problem, but the constraint problem. Um, a paper I want to mention with Stanley Deser on the stability of flat space. Her work, which becomes recently more important, uh, even more important than before, on the positivity of mass in a neighborhood of Minkowski space, and uh, some indications on how the new formulation of Einstein's equation that she gave us uh, were important in several ways for uh, numerical relativity, uh, the success of numerical relativity. Uh, first, uh, just to complete uh, Lydia's beautiful uh, sketch of the biography of Yvonne. 
let me say that she considered herself as a failed physicist. She would have liked, like his father, like her father, to be a physicist. And uh, this meant that she was constantly aiming at understanding the real universe through the theoretical physics equations and using and perfecting mathematical tools. Just uh, a few words about the three important uh, father figures, let's say, in her early life. Uh, her father, Georges Bruya, who in my youth was very uh, famous for his contribution to optics and the many textbooks uh, he wrote, but Although she loved her father and the fact that her father died in the very uh, sad circumstances, uh, also because he wanted to protect Jewish students from Ecole Normale, that's why finally he, was, uh, he died. Uh, but still, Yvonne, who never uh, minced a word, said, in a sense, although my father had a significant influence on me, it must be said that he had more interest in my brother because the brother of uh, Yvonne, François Bruya, is a very famous mathematician in France. And clearly the parents thought that the brother was the gifted person and that uh, Yvonne could uh, probably not become a renowned scientist, but a good mother and a gymnasium teacher. So she had to overcome that. Also, when upon the suggestion of Loret, she had chosen as a thesis topic to give the first mathematical proof of the existence and well posedness of generic non-analytic solution of Einstein's vacuum equations, when she said that to uh, Lishnerovitz, a uh, PhD uh, thesis advisor, Lishnerovitz said, this is too difficult for, sorry, a beginner, okay? But Jean Leray was more positive and he encouraged and helped her to solve this problem, okay? So she had to overcome this. Sorry, let me go back. Oh. Yes, now three plus one decomposition. Um, we all know that when we slice uh, space-time by a family of space-like Cauchy-type hypersurfaces, uh, we can decompose the 10 components of the space-time metric in the components of a uh, uh, spatial restriction to the slice and then the lapse variable n or alpha and uh, the shift variable uh, alpha uh, or beta. Okay. Now what is uh, less known is that even because usually in textbooks uh, the explicit form of Einstein's equation when you decompose it in three plus one with equation containing the lapse and shift and the gamma IJ metric are attributed, are called by the name of Arnovit Desermisner, who definitely made very important work in this. But still, Yvonne liked to remind people that she did that first, uh, first in 1948, and then in 19, uh, full details were published in 1956. This is a uh, an uh, abstract of her paper, some equation from her paper containing uh, all the explicit results. Uh, and so concerning the three plus one decomposition, uh, not only had she done this, by the way, Darmois was the first one to consider the special case of Gaussian coordinates when the lapse is one and the shift is zero, but uh, she was the first to, to write these general equations. And then she was also the first one to discuss methods for constructing general solutions of initial values, uh, initial value constraints. Uh, Lishnerovitz had considered uh, less general cases. So let me remind you of the, how the constraints uh, look. Uh, when you have the uh, first fundamental form, the metric induced on an hypersurface sigma, and geometrically, the second fundamental form, uh, the ex extrinsic curvature K, uh, then they must satisfy um, these e equations. Um, Darmois was the, the first one to understand, as Lydia said, that these existed, and he, um, he wrote them actually uh, in his 1927 book, but uh, 
but did not really discuss uh, methods of solutions. The first person to really tackle the problem was Racine in 1934. And in particular, the idea of decomposing, conformally decomposing the, the metric on sigma in a conformal factor to the fourth power, phi to the fourth, and then uh, another given metric gamma ij, and also of scaling k in this way with phi square was introduced by Racine in 1934. And then he, he wrote down uh, what is just conventionally gener generally called the Lichnerowitz equation, which is the elliptic equation for phi that you get, and, and then the separate equation for um, k tilde, the trace three part, let us say. And, um, and Racine already in 1934 had uh, shown that in the case where uh, trace of k is zero, they decouple, and then you have this simple system. Um, but Yvonne in 1961 was the first one to introduce general ways of getting solutions uh, of this system. In particular, she introduced a new elliptic system, which is obtained from uh, harmonic coordinate uh, reduction. When you write Einstein equations in four dimensions in harmonic coordinates in terms of the Gothic variables, you have a different form of this elliptic system. And she showed that this system was sorry, uh, uh, was um, elliptic. Uh, and therefore, that, uh, yes. And, and later, Vaillant Simon showed uh, rigorously how to construct solutions, the existence of solution near fast space. And then after the important work of uh, Jimmy York on general solution of the momentum constraints, there were many papers by Yvonne on constructing asymptotically flat solutions of the Hamiltonian constraints in various uh, spaces, Hölder spaces and sub spaces. For details, uh, you should uh, see a book uh, of 2009 at the Oxford University Press. And also, I mentioned a very nice uh, paper of 2014 called Beginnings of the Cauchy Problem, where she uh, summarizes uh, many work on the Cauchy Problem. Uh, let me now mention uh, this paper that until recently I was not aware of by um, Yvonne and uh, Stanley. Uh, Stanley passed away uh, uh, not, uh, I mean, not long ago, and uh, so the title is uh, is interesting on the stability of flat space. It does not compete with the result of uh, Chrysodoulou, Kleinerman, and, and others, because uh, but this is quite an interesting work. Still, uh, what they what they show is that. Uh, if you consider all solutions of the linearized constraint equation around flat space, so you take the constraint equations, you linearize them around flat space, which means from a physicist point of view, you need uh, you have equations for the data for a massless spin two field, you know, uh, HIJTT and uh, and the time derivative of this, satisfying some uh, simple equations. And, and what they show is that uh, not only there exist solutions uh, of this type, but that the most general uh, solution of the linearized constraint equation is the tangent to uh, a curve uh, giving rise to an exact solution. And this is what they call stability of the vacuum, okay, which is an interesting measure of the stability of the uh, flat space okay, in this sense. Now, let me uh, mention an important work by Yvonne and, and Marsden in 1976, which uh, before the important work of Schoen and Yao and uh, Ed Witten, uh, actually gave the first rigorous proof of the positivity of mass for vacuum Einstein spacetime near Minkowski. They followed an uh, initial idea of uh, Dieter Brill and Stanley Deser. But they, they brought uh, a rigorous proof using a critical point analysis in uh, infinite dimensions. And, and I was told by uh, some mathematician colleagues at um, IHES that uh, they realized that now this, uh, 
this work of uh, Yvonne um, uh, is quite important and uh, has been uh, forgotten after the breakthrough of Schön and Yao, but should not be forgotten. Let me also mention that uh, in the, she she spent uh, like uh, more than uh, ten years of her after retirement life uh, at IHS. So I had the pleasure of learning many things uh, from her. And uh, during these years, she continued working a lot, not only writing several books but also research papers. And in particular, in 2011, she gave a simplified, rigorous proof, spinorial proof, a la Ed Witten of uh, energy positivity and mass positivity in any dimension, and you can find this on archive. Now, uh, yes, and let me now mention uh, this, yes, why is it blocked here? It's usually one is saying uh, that there are problems with using the C plus one formulation for solving Einstein's equations because it is folklore knowledge that if you use this full evolution equations written here in three plus one decomposition, um, when you integrate them on the computer, it was realized initially, you know, from a very naive physicist point of view, they look good in the sense that you have first order evolution equation for the metric in space, HIJ, and the first fundamental form, KIJ. And on the right hand side, you have some functionals of the metric and K and some gauge function, lapse and shift. But if you, it looks innocent to say, okay, I give some values to the lapse and shift, and then I have first order evolution equation, it should work. When people try to do that at the beginning of, general, of numerical relativity, they realize very soon that this gave a very bad. Uh, um, I mean, the code would crash very fast, numerical instabilities. Actually, it was shown only recently by Yvonne in 2009 that this system is hyperbolic, but in a non-strict way, in the Lore oya uh, sense, uh, which means that it has causality properties and domain of dependence, but you need to use uh, Gevray classes of uh, smooth functions, which means nearly analytic, but not quite analytic functions. So, Definitely not something that you have in a numerical code, uh, but still it is more hyperbolic than what you thought. And but what I want to say is, Yvonne worked a lot, uh, and uh, in particular in a breakthrough work in 1982-83 with uh, Tommaso Ruggeri, in constructing. Um, um, let's say three plus one type evolution system representation of Einstein's equations, but that would be hyperbolic in the in the strict sense, okay, in the Lore sense or in the first order good sense. And in particular, she had found um, in this work with uh, Tommaso Ruggeri that if uh, you don't use fully harmonic coordinates, but only the time coordinate is harmonic, it gives you a relation between the lapse and the square root of the determinant of the spatial metric. And this suffices in the zero shift case, and this was generalized by work by Yvonne with Jimmy York in the non zero shift case to give a system which is hyperbolic in a, in a good sense. Okay. And, uh, and, and here is the system they wrote. Okay. This system, which looks uh, complicated, uh, is uh, hyperbolic in a good sense. And the reason why I am mentioning this is that. This original idea of Yvonne and, and Ruggeri trickled down to some of the numerical relativity uh, ways of coding Einstein equations, which are used uh, today. Indeed, in this time harmonic slicing that she was using, which is the first equation on this slide, uh, later Bona and Masso understood that you can. Um, by introducing a function of alpha on the right hand side to change alpha square in two over alpha, you get uh, a related uh, slicing that they call one plus log uh, gamma slicing. And this one plus log gamma slicing in some variant is used today in, in, in many codes in, in numerical relativity 
together with minimal distortion like choice of special um, gauges a la Smart York, okay, which have evolved into this called gamma driver equations. And all this is part of the BSSN formulations, Shibata, Nakamura, Bao, Baumgarten, Shapiro formulations. And today, together with the use of punctures from Brandt and Brugman to represent black holes without having the problem of the excision, excision of uh, horizon and making the punctures move like uh, Manuela Campanelli, Carlos Lusto, Maronetti and Sloshover showed how to work. This is an extremely efficient way of, uh, of solving Einstein equations on the computer. Uh, we are actually doing some work uh, recently with numerical people, with Carlos Lusto, and indeed this works very well. But as we know, the uh, breakthrough work by Yvonne in 19, that she worked on in 1950-51, um, published in 1952, used harmonic coordinates because this gives a diagonal hyperbolic uh, system for Einstein's equations. And, uh, and, and this is a tradition that has evolved in another very important thing in numerical relativity, like uh, the harmonic coordinate condition, which is this one, leads to reduced Einstein equations of this form. And as you know, um, the fact that the harmonic condition is satisfied initially because this condition satisfies a propagation equation, it is preserved in time, as she showed. This has been generalized, uh, notably by David Garfinkel and Helmut Friedrich in 2002, uh, where you can put gauge function, instead of saying that these are wave coordinates, this is not zero, but some given function, then this function can itself evolve by some equations. And then another uh, uh, very important input, apart from this generalized harmonic condition, was to add uh, constraint damping terms, to add in Einstein's equations, extra term, that contain the constraints, what is zero in principle. So in principle, you say you could set it to zero, but when you set it to zero in the equation, there are instabilities which make they don't stay zero. Why, if you add them in the evolution equation of Einstein's equation, they, they tend, the errors tend to dampen uh, exponentially in time when you put kappa uh, positive, because you have this equation with this diffusion, I mean, uh, uh, extra term. This was introduced by uh, Karsten uh, Gunlar and then used, uh, Franz Pretorius was the first one to in, in understand the importance of this and then Lee Lindblom et al. Uh, contributed a lot to the development. So I am saying this because you see the two type of uh, uh, methods that uh, Ange, uh, Yvonne had initiated they came to fruition uh, first in 2005 when Franz Pretorius, using generalized harmonic with constraint damping, solved for the first time what is the, um, the curvature emitted during the coalescence of two black holes. And, and then uh, Manuela Campanelli and, and others, uh, a few months later, uh, using BSSN with one plus log gamma driver and moving punctures, uh, got, uh, as you can see, more accurate results uh, on the same problem. To, to finish, let me uh, mention the many uh, that not only Yvonne all her life and till a few years ago has made uh, fundamental research contributions, but she contributed to the knowledge of many people in the field uh, through a writing of many information-laden, uh, influential books, very clear books. This started uh, early on when she was a professor at the university in France. And then there are the famous books, oops, uh, let me play slideshow again. Uh, the books with uh, Cécile uh, De Witt, and then uh, while she was at IHES, uh, she decided to uh, consecrate, and I admire her for this, spend a lot of energy writing um, fantastic books, summarizing a lot of the work over many years by her and many others on general relativity and the Einstein equations. 
Oxford University Press in 2009. Then she wrote a student book, an introduction for young people to learn uh, general relativity, black holes, and cosmology, but with the, the rigor of having very clear statements about you know, many folklore results. When you read this book, students understand the details of strong high frequency waves, of solution of Einstein equations, of black hole formation. And then at the end, in 2017, she wrote indeed her memoirs, um, first in French and then with the help of uh, friends like Vince Moncrief, who helped her with the translation, uh, a lady mathematician in this uh, strange uh, universe. Okay, that's all. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you, Thibault, for that uh, wonderful talk. Um, I just wanted to make uh, one and a half remarks about uh, um, numerical relativity. Um, so um, uh, generalized harmonic coordinates were invented by Helmut Friedrich, not me. I, I learned about them from him. Um, I wrote um, some early harmonic codes um, using Helmut's ideas. Um, another thing that I learned from Helmut was that um, in the very early days of numerical relativity, um, Yvonne suggested to the numerical relativists that they should use harmonic coordinates, um, but they didn't take up her suggestion. And, and, um, and that's unfortunate because the field uh, might have uh, advanced by about a decade um, if, if they had done so. Um, Okay, so um, our next talk um, is going to be um, by Sergio Kleinerman. So, um, Thibault, maybe you can stop screen sharing and, uh, and yes, Sergio, you, you can start while I introduce you. Let me, yes, where do I stop screen sharing? It's here. Yeah, so I think, yeah, there you go. Perfect. Okay, so I stopped. Okay. Good. Uh, okay, and and Sergio, maybe you can uh, you can start. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, so uh, we're we're very happy to um, have our our third talk um, by uh, Sergio Kleinerman, who's a, a professor of mathematics at uh, Princeton University, and um, uh, one of the themes that we've seen already um, is the um, local existence of solutions to Einstein's equation um, pioneered uh, by Yvonne. Um, so um, a natural question then is, what about global existence solutions that, that go on forever? Um, and this is a, a very difficult problem, which was finally solved um, uh, by um, Sergio in, in collaboration uh, with Chris Dulu. Um, and um, so, uh, We'll, we'll perhaps learn something about that um, in, in this talk. And um, in, in addition, more recently, um, Sergio has also um, uh, obtained um, uh, similar um, results for the stability of the curve space time. Um, and uh, OK, so uh, Sergio, please, uh, please begin your talk. Well, but first of all, thank, thanks, thanks a lot for the introduction. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Uh, Yvonne uh, is really uh, one of the persons I admire most. Uh, I met her very early on in my career, and I always found her extremely supportive and uh, a very interesting person to talk to. And uh, I, uh, I, on, I can only say that... Uh, I really admire her a lot. Um, so uh, I I will talk mostly. I mean, already people have. I mean, my predecessors have talked about uh, a lot of her work, and um, it's quite amazing how many parts of mathematical general relativity she has. Yvonne has worked on. I will try uh, to take a small part of, of her contribution. In particular, I'll talk about uh, uh, the legacy of Yvonne's foundational ACTA paper. So let me um, then go on uh, with a plan, first of all. So this is the ACTA paper in 1952 that's called Existence Theorems for the Einstein Gravitational Field Equations in the non analytic case. So, uh, already this has been touched upon. There were results before on the analytic case. 
This uses uh, Koshy-Kovalevsky, uh, and they are not very surprising. Uh, the non-analytic case is, of course, much harder. It uses a hyperbolicity of the Einstein equations, which were not very well understood, except in the linear case. Uh, and uh, Yvonne, of course, uh, made a huge contribution. Uh, I will talk a little bit then about uh, existence results based on the energy method. I'll talk about uh, the bounded L2 theorem uh, that uh, Lydia has already mentioned. Uh, I'll talk also about the kirchhoff sobolev type results that she actually used in her ACTA paper. She used this kirchhoff sobolev formula, which, uh, again, Lydia mentioned, but uh, maybe I'll say a little bit more about this. And uh, uh, then uh, uh, the vector field method, the null condition and stability of Minkowski, that um, uh, is my work with Christodoulou. And of course, it was followed by many other, many other results. Uh, and then finally, I talk about the case stability, the mo uh, most recent results with uh, Jeremy Seftel and also uh, with uh, Elena Georgi. Okay, so uh, again, I mean, uh, the introduction to uh, the introduction to the Einstein equations was already done. Uh, obviously, I'm going to talk mostly about the Einstein vacuum equations. Uh, so, reach equal to zero. So, these are uh, obviously uh, just purely geometric equations of great interest and also great difficulty. Uh, as as already was already mentioned, uh, the equations uh, really show their hyperbolic character when uh, you introduce isothermal coordinates, or uh, people call them harmonic coordinates. I prefer to, to call them wave coordinates because, as you can see, the coordinates verify the wave equation. Uh, so again, was mentioned that this was done already by the Donder in 1921 and Lanchos in 1922. Uh, uh, the equations take this very simple form, which was mentioned by uh, Lydia. Uh, and then, of course, once you realize that the equations are hyperbolic, you look at the initial value problem. Uh, so you set up initial conditions on a on a given hypersurface, three-dimensional hypersurface. We are still in four dimensions. Of course, you can do things in, in other dimensions, in higher dimensions. Uh, and you set up the initial conditions and, of course, uh, the constraint equations will have to be satisfied. And this was already mentioned both by Lydia and uh, by Thibault. So uh, it was also mentioned that uh, uh, what Yvonne did was not just to prove a local existence result for this system of hyperbolic equations. So this is a, a nonlinear system of uh, wave equations. Uh, it is diagonal relative to the, the principal terms, which are second derivative of the metric. Uh, and uh, uh, she also produced together with Geroc a, a concept of uh, so-called maximal future global hyperbolic development, uh, which uh, once that has been introduced, and it, it was already mentioned by Lydia, once it has been introduced, then essentially all of mathematical general relativity is about understanding the character of this maximum future global hyperbolic development. In other words, is it complete? Do you have singularities? Do you have naked singularity? Cosmic censorship, all sorts of questions are really framed in within the framework uh, of the maximum future global hyperbolic development. In other words, everything from now on is about understanding this maximal future global hyperbolic development. So if nothing else, this was an amazing uh, achievement made by uh, Yvonne. So uh, let's go back to uh, to her actual lecture. I mean, sorry, uh, her actual paper. So uh, there were in fact two papers uh, on, on this uh, global existence result. Uh, there was, a, of course, the Acta Mathematica paper in 1952, which is called Theorem d'existence pour certain système d'équation dérivé partiel non linéaire. Uh, but there was also the, a, a, a shorter paper, a contre rendu of Academy of Science paper, which was presented by 
uh, Adam Mark was the most famous mathematician maybe at that time. Uh, so this was uh, by itself uh, a remarkable achievement. Uh, for Yvonne, who was very, very young, and who was also one of the first few uh, women mathematicians to, to do serious research in mathematics. Uh, so uh, uh, so this, uh, what she proves in the Acta, Mathematic, uh, Acta Mathematica is a local existence and uniqueness for second order hyperbolic equations. In fact, exactly the kind of equations uh, that are obtained by uh, using wave coordinates. Uh, what is remarkable in the, that paper, which uh, was mentioned by Vidya, but relatively few people know, is that she used, in fact, uh, not the methods which are common today, which are based on energy estimates, but rather a, a Kirchhoff-Sobolev uh, formula. So uh, this goes back, in fact, the, the use of uh, this type of uh, formulas uh, goes back to uh, Sobolev in 1936, where he used this um, idea in order to solve uh, equations which are quasi-linear wave equations, but instead of having systems, which are the kind of things that show up in, in, in general relativity, he looked at the uh, scalar case when you have just one equation. Uh, in any case, uh, her result, because of the use of uh, of uh, the kirchhoff sobolev formula uh, does not give you the best, the optimal regularity. So as it was mentioned already by Lydia, the metric has to be uh, in C5. So it has, it has to have five continuous derivatives on the initial data on sigma zero, excuse me. And the second fundamental form has to have four derivatives. So uh, let's uh, go a little bit about uh, on the kirchhoff sobolev formula. Uh, so uh, the equation, uh, the simplest equation that you could solve by this re representation formula is uh, you have the wave operators associated to a given Lorentzian metric, uh, phi is equal to f, and you set up the initial conditions on sigma zero. So this is again a, a space-like hypersurface on this Lorentzian manifold uh, to be zero. And then the, the formula, the kirchhoff sobolev formula, is uh, for pi, phi evaluated at a point in space-time is an integral over the nalcon, uh, the uh, past nalcon from p uh, of something uh, which is called w times the function f here and uh, minus an error term. So w, uh, in, in the, the particular case when the metric is uh, exactly the Minkowski metric. So in the flat case, this W is in fact uh, one over two R or something like that. So it's, it's, it's very explicit. And this term is in fact zero, okay? Uh, this uh, second derivative of trace chi uh, is uh, what is called an expansion for those who know the the, I mean, the, the, this is a, the sort of thing that comes a lot in general relativity. It's in fact uh, expre expressed in terms of the version of U, where U is a solution of the iconal equation. In fact, uh, this formula is obtained very easily by uh, by doing this uh, calculation, where you take the delta function over uh, U equal constant, where U is a, a function. Uh, multiplied by W, you calculate, you get uh, this four pi delta of P minus S, provided that U verifies the iconal equation. So you use U here to verify the iconal equation with uh, data equal to zero on the light cone. So this is uh, the light cone uh, from the point P. The expansion is, as I said, this trace chi is the ambition of U. And then W here, verifies uh, transport equation, which is uh, just very simple, involving steel trace of chi, and this is the initial data uh, starting from the point P. And uh, well, that's a formula. And uh, as you see, you get this very complicated error term. And uh, there is a lot of work on uh, in this, in fact, was started by Hadama. So th these sort of formulas for, for general metrics were already started by Hadamai in 1932. Uh, but what he was doing, he was trying to eliminate this term, this uh, error term, by 
uh, solving infinity many transport equations. So he was not stopping here, but solving lots of them. And uh, what Sobolev remarked is that actually you can stop at the first transport equation, you get this third term, but somehow uh, in applications to the quasi-linear wave equations, you can you can deal with that term. And of course, uh, it's what Yvonne does also. The ma major difference is that she applies it to systems of quasi-linear wave equations rather than uh, just uh, one uh, wave equation. And that requires major modifications of how you, in particular, of how you solve the transport equation. How do you choose this W? Uh, you, uh, is in fact a solution of the Eichhorn equation, even in the, the, the general case that she, she considers. So, uh, so uh, what I want to point out, rather than going, I mean, I'm not going to say any more uh, details on what uh, uh, Yvonne does in her ACTA paper, um, uh, but I want to say something about, about consequences uh, which are connected to her work. Uh, so first of all, nowadays, uh, people don't use anymore the kirchhoff sobolev formula or kirchhoff hadamard if you want, uh, except uh, for propagation of singularity type results and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, in nonlinear equations, uh, they are not really used too much. Uh, people prefer to use the energy uh, estimates, which I will talk a little bit more in a, in a moment. But uh, ne nevertheless, there was a remarkable result by Erdely Moncrief in 1982, uh, which was on in a nonlinear case. It was not like, it was a little bit easier than the Einstein equations because uh, it's a semi-linear equation rather than, than quasi-linear. Uh, and that's where the Kirchhoff formula was used. Uh, and then, uh, uh, we use a Kirchhoff formula for general relativity. So uh, me together with Rodniansky in 2010, uh, where we, uh, we use a Kirchhoff formula to prove a breakdown criteria in general relativity. This was improved later on by Kian, a student of mine in 2012. In any case, the result uh, is stated here. So this is the theorem. You, you consider a Lorentz metric, which is a solution of the Einstein equation. So Einstein vacuum equations have to be satisfied, but the metric is expressed in terms of, of a lapse and uh, uh, the induced metric on, uh, on T equal constant hypersurfaces. You have a time function here, uh, and uh, you assume that uh, the level surfaces sigma T of uh, T equal constant are, are maximal or constant mean curvature. Uh, and then the result says that the space-time can be continued past the equal T star. Uh, so in other words, uh, if the solution exists up to a value of T equal T star, and if you have this integral here to be finite, then the solution can be continued past it. So in other words, it's, a, it's really a breakdown criteria because it tells you more or less uh, how things could break down. And uh, uh, I, I would say the result really, uh, uh, for people who know uh, the Euler, incompressible Euler equations, there is a famous result, the Bill Katomaida result, which is similar in spirit. So uh, so this was uh, done by using the uh, kirchhoff sobolev formula. Uh, I can explain very fast what were the main ideas. First of all, this condition, this star condition, uh, which we have here, is uh, enough to be able to prove L2 norms for the curvature. Uh, so the L2 norm, so this is the Riemann curvature tensor type T. Uh, it also allows you to prove higher derivative estimates, provided that in addition to star, you also have an L infinity norm on the curvature, and then you get higher derivatives in L2 of the curvature, again at, at any T. And, uh, and then this is a main point. This is where you use the kirchhoff sobolev formula. Uh, if you have this condition star and you have the L2 norm, which you already have proved as a consequence of this in the first part, then you also get an L infinity norm. Uh, and, uh, and then it's exactly this step where you use a kirchhoff sobolev formula. Uh, there is uh, one important thing that I would just mention in passing, that in order to control the error term, which uh, as you see involves this trace sky, 
Uh, this requires uh, an understanding of the geometry of these now hypersurfaces. So remember that n minus of p is a, out the, the past uh, now hypersurface initiating at the point p. And uh, uh, one needs to control the geometry, in particular, you need to control the radius of injectivity uh, of this. Typically, this is done by uh, an infinity norms of, a, of the curvature. Uh, so the, the main point in making this stuff work uh, is that actually we can show that we can estimate the radius of injectivity uh, using only the curvature flux. In other words, L2 curvature, which is again connected to this, uh, on the on the uh, on the uh, past null con starting from point P. So this is a, a series of papers quite difficult uh, with uh, Rodniansky, which turns out to be also important in other things. In fact, maybe I'll mention it also comes in the bounded L2 curvature. So uh, let's go back. Let's go now to results based on energy estimates. So uh, again. Uh, Yvonne used the kirchhoff solar formula, which uses, loses a derivative. If you compare the kirchhoff solar formula with uh, energy estimates, you see that uh, in, in the energy estimate, you can estimate uh, the first derivative of phi in terms of f on the right-hand side, while the kirchhoff solar, solar formula, you estimate only phi. So again, a derivative. And uh, again, uh, there was uh, one of the most important uh, stories of the the first 50 years of the last century uh, in partial differential equations is the ability to solve uh, hyperbolic equations, which are supposed to be the hardest, uh, in particular nonlinear hyperbolic equations, would be the hardest type of uh, nonlinear equations. Uh, there were results by Friedrich and Levy in 1928. This was the first one that introduces the energy estimates. Schauder in 1935, but this is uh, this is done, uh, uh, as I said, with the kirchhoff sobolev uh, Sorry, this was done already. Uh, yeah, th this is done already with L2. Uh, and the Sobolev, which I, uh, is done by kirchhoff sobolev uh, the, the uh, post-acta papers uh, are then uh, Loray in 1952, Friedrichs in 1954, which introduces the extraordinarily important concept of symmetric hyperbolic systems. Uh, Fisher, Mazdan, Mazdan in 1972, where uh, using uh, the formulation in symmet symmetric hyperbolic systems and using energy estimates improves a lot the result of uh, Yvonne. Uh, so you get in particular that the metric can be in HS. So this is a Sobolev space uh, on sigma zero. This is HS minus one where S is larger than three half plus one. So remember, you compare this with, with five derivatives of, of the metric and four derivative of uh, the second fundamental form of Yvonne's. Uh, so then uh, there was some uh, result in 2005, which was uh, in, which improved this by a lot by going all the, all the way to S larger than two, uh, which was uh, then improved in this bounded L2 curvature, curvature theorem in 2015. So this is a work of uh, together with Rodniansky and Seftel. Uh, so th this, uh, I, I must say the game here is not necessarily to keep improving. The, the important thing is uh, this other exponent, which is S equal to three half. So if you could go from three half plus one if you go to three half, in other words, you would gain more than derivative, uh, then you would be in the critical exponent where a local existence result uh, will actually imply global existence. So somehow this would be, uh, so this is in fact the question, uh, is there a skinny variant version of well poseness? In other words, can, uh, can you go all the way to S over three half or something else that would be scaling invariant? Uh, which will uh, prove global existence. By the way, this uh, such a result, will, of course, will imply, imply, I forgot to put him implication here, will imply the stability of Minkowski space, uh, but it will be a remarkable proof of stability of Minkowski space in uh, Sobolev spaces without any decay, uh, any weighted norms. In other words, it will be a scaling invariant and translation invariant 
proof of stability of Minkowski space. So the, the major difficulty from going to S equal to two to uh, S equal to three half is actually uh, connected with what I said earlier. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, in the control of the radius of injectivity. So it turns out that uh, that uh, 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 S equal to two is a minimum that you need in order to construct the radius of injectivity of null hypersurfaces. And these null hypersurfaces play a fundamental role in the proof. Anyway, so this is, uh, this is about uh, uh, bounded L2. So let's talk a little bit about stability of Minkowski space. So this is, uh, by the way, uh, Yvonne has another uh, very important paper, small paper, uh, which uh, has not been mentioned, but uh, which played a very important role, uh, I think, in my discussions with uh, Dimitris Kestodulu at the time when we realized how to uh, to solve, uh, to get the stability of Minkowski space. Uh, so this is uh, Yvonne, 1973, in Theorem de Instabilité pour certain équation hyperbolique non linéaire. Uh, where she shows that uh, if you write down the Einstein equations in wave coordinates and you linearize them in looking as words at the first iterate, non-trivial iterate uh, in the nonlinear equation, you, uh, you see uh, logarithmic divergence. Uh, and then somehow, I mean, I remember having discussions with her about this and uh, she uh, told to me that uh, Einstein, it, she had discussions earlier when she was in Princeton with Einstein and uh, Einstein somehow thought, at least that's what she says, is that the, the, the Minkowski space is in fact unstable. And she uh, took this result as sort of uh, indication that uh, maybe the Minkowski space is indeed unstable. Uh, well, it turns out uh, that that's not the case. Uh, the sequence, uh, there was a sequence of results before the stability of Minkowski space, which played an important role in the proof. Uh, there were results of uh, Fritz John, uh, myself in 1980, uh, which are based sort of on, on understanding decay of solutions of wave equations. Uh, in particular, what was very important is to do it using a vector field method approach, in other words, a geometric approach rather than, than parametrices. Uh, for example, Fourier methods, which would be will give you a parametrics, uh, but they those things tend to be uh, rather difficult to apply uh, in perturbations of Minkowski space. So the vector field method was a major uh, thing that was developed. Uh, the null condition was another very very important thing, which is uh, exactly connected with this uh, observation of Yvonne. It turns out that the null condition, the way we understand now. Uh, is just not verified for the Einstein equation in wave coordinates. In other words, in uh, harmonic coordinates, or wave coordinates, what you, uh, you want to call it. Uh, but nevertheless, the Einstein equations themselves verify the null condition, provided that you are not using the wave coordinates, but you're using a better, a better approach. In, in particular, we used, in fact, sort of a geometric approach where um, this null type of condition is automatically verified. Uh, so anyway, stability of Minkowski space in 1993 depends on uh, sort of understanding the gauge choice. By the way, it's a, also a, an important thing to to realize that uh, yeah, maybe uh, I'll mention I'll, I'll mention a little bit later. Uh, in any case, there is a flexible gauge choice. Uh, the use of characteristics plays an important role uh, because. Uh, the iconal equations, uh, you, in fact, in a certain sense, when you prove stability of Minkowski space, you prove stability of the Einstein equations themselves together with the solution of the iconal equations on the Minkowski space itself. The iconal equation is used so, uh, in order to understand the propagation properties uh, of waves uh, in uh, or gravitational waves. Uh, so then there is a, this interesting version of the null condition, which I, I mentioned, uh, which is somehow gauge independent. Uh, there is another important result that needs to be mentioned by Lindblad and Rodnianski in 2005, who went back to uh, wave coordinates and showed that nevertheless, even though the null condition is not verified, you can still get a global existence result. Uh, 
uh, it's not maybe as precise as ours, but anyway, it gives you global existence. And it's based on uh, the observation that uh, the Einstein equations in wave coordinates do not verify the null condition, but verify what they call the weak null condition. So the weak null condition is what allows you so, uh, to still prove a global existence result. Uh, so there are many other global existence results that were proved afterwards uh, in vacuum. So for identical equations in vacuum, there was my work with Nicolo, there was a work of Bieri, uh, work of Huneau, uh, and uh, recently a work of uh, a student of uh, Jeremy Sertel, work by Shen, which improves uh, on the result of, uh, of Bieri. That unfortunately, I won't have too much time to talk about it, but it's a, it's a very interesting result. Uh, uh, then there is uh, Einstein equations with matter. Uh, we have matter on the right-hand side, so there, there are results by Zipser, the Flochma, so on and so forth, right? I, I'm not going to, uh, I want to be able to talk more about them. Uh, the open question about this, stability of Minkowski space is uh, the following. So this is connected with the bounded L2 uh, remarks I made earlier. Is there a scale invariant version of the stability of Minkowski space? Or uh, uh, one can phrase this differently, which is uh, it's not tied to scale invariance. Is there a translation invariant version of stability of Minkowski space? In other words, uh, assume just that, I don't know, H100, where H is a sovereign space, uh, of the initial data is less than epsilon, uh, do you have, uh, do you have uh, stability? Uh, remember that all the results that we have today uh, are, using, uh, are using much stronger assumptions of, on decay of the initial data at space like infinity. So the, the, the use of, uh, of uh, uh, weighted norms uh, are essential in the proof of the stability result. All right, so that uh, I, I guess uh, the only thing that I can still talk about uh, is the stability of uh, black hole. So, so this is uh, the famous uh, conjecture, uh, excuse me. So this is a conjecture on the uh, stability of Kerr solutions. So I recall that the Kerr family of solution is a uh, so these are solutions uh, which are stationary of the Einstein equations in vacuum, uh, depending on two parameters, A, which corresponds to, to, to rotating black holes. So these are black holes. Uh, M corresponds to the mass, uh, absolute value of A is less than M. So the, the conjecture says that uh, uh, if you start with a Kerr solution, which can be represented schematically using the Penrose diagram, can be uh, represented like this. Uh, so this is a horizon of the black hole. This is a, the interior of the black hole. Uh, this is a, a space-like hypersurface. This is a domain of hotel communication. You take a space-like hypersurface. You don't have to go all the way here, but somewhere inside. And uh, you look at the initial data induced by the Kerr solution on such a space-like hypersurface. And you do perturb, you perturb those initial data uh, such that they that you have lost your voice. Yeah, Sergio, can you hear us? We uh, we we can't hear you. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Now, now we can hear you again. All right. So why don't, why don't you try uh, sharing the screen again and and, uh, and and seeing if you can go on with your talk. How much time do I have? I guess. Uh, maybe uh, I should... Yeah, I'm not sure. What What do you think, Emanuele? We're almost at the end. I, uh, we're supposed to wrap up by one p.m. Let's say. 
Yeah. Okay. So I may not said most, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, I mean, this is. Uh, yeah, I, I have very little left. So, uh, so this is a stability of care solution. The theorem that we we have proved uh, recently uh, in a sequence of uh, five papers. In fact, uh, there is a uh, the main paper where the result is stated, uh, which is uh, Seftel and myself in two thousand twenty one. Uh, then there are some uh, important papers which we called uh, GCM. So this is for generally covariant modulated papers uh, by uh, 2019. And, and then there is another work. Uh, so these are two papers and another one. And then there is finally, uh, I can I don't see here. Uh, there is a, a work with uh, Elena, Georgie, and, uh, and Seftel uh, in uh, 2021, 2022, uh, which really uh, prove the conjecture if the uh, angular momentum is sufficiently small, right? So it's much, much smaller than one. Of course, uh, what remains uh, entirely open is what happens when you have large angular momentum. Uh, uh, I obviously, I don't have time to talk about, I mean, I won't have time to talk about this. Maybe I'll just mention at the end. So this is, the construction is based actually on, on sort of a, a sequence or if you want a, a family, a continuous family of space-time with boundaries. So they are finite with boundaries and they converge, finally they converge to the care solution. Uh, so the boundaries have to be chosen very carefully. So in particular, this boundary is of fundamental importance and that's where sort of the, the gauge condition, the, it, it's crucial in the whole proof to pick up the right gauge condition. Uh, and uh, it turns out that, that the gauge conditions that we impose uh, are novel in the sense that uh, it's the first time that you actually construct a co-dimension two surface uh, without any relation to the initial data. So you think of the initial data being somewhere here. Uh, so you construct something uh, like this. And it's exactly because of, of this construction from infinity uh, that we are able to sort of get the the recall, uh, the fact that uh, the final black hole uh, differs substantially uh, from the initial black hole. And uh, anyway, so uh, that's where I should stop. The important, the, there are a few ideas, uh, but uh, insofar as the gauge conditions is concerned, it all uh, is included in the definition of a star and this definition of this uh, space. So this is a space-like hypersurface that's initiates of a star, which also has to satisfy specific uh, gauge conditions. Anyway, this I'll, I'll stop. Um, okay, uh, thank you, uh, Sergio, for that uh, wonderful talk. Um, so um, why don't you go ahead and stop sharing your screen and um, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Emanuele for, uh, for any additional remarks. I don't have too many additional remarks. I would like to thank you all. There were three beautiful talks. Um, I think you really did justice to Yvonne and uh, her contributions. I would like to see if there are a few questions from uh, the many people that uh, are here today, um, if they have questions for the speakers, this, this is the time to bring them up. Yeah, Thibault. I just wanted to make a remark after the nice talk of Sergio, when he said that from the mathematical perspective, the fact that when you solve Einstein equations in harmonic coordinates, you have logarithmic divergences. I mean, not one over R behavior, but log of R over R. This was well understood by physicists, by Vladimir Fock, okay? In his book of 1959, he, where he insisted on using harmonic coordinates for some reason, uh, he had to deal with it. And then he showed explicitly that you can gauge away this log and then etc. And he gets actually before Bondi, he gets uh, 
that you have a transformation to bondi like coordinates. Okay, it was just this remark that uh, again, often physicists and mathematicians not always talked at the right moment. <laughs> yeah, but um, um, as no, please, Sergio, go on. No, I just say I'm happy that I talked to Yvonne at the right moment. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just uh, wanted to thank you all for organizing uh, this meeting and I, I will go and visit my mother in 10 days, so I, I will tell her. And uh, I especially wanted to thank Lydia, who I didn't know, but for the very nice uh, family uh, scheme she gave, uh, very well documented and uh, all the details she gave about uh, my mother life. So. That was very nice. And thank you, of course, for the science, but uh, that was more difficult for me to uh, to follow. That's all. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us too. Uh, Lydia, yes. Yeah, maybe, I mean, yeah, thank you also, Genevieve. So happy to meet you online, maybe at some point in person in Paris or somewhere. <laughs> So I think it's it's been just wonderful. I mean, uh, Yvonne is really maybe the big figure or one of the very few who was able to bring the mathematical and physical community together. And she has collaborated with so many mathematicians and physicists and has been able to speak. Sometimes we all know, right, uh, I'm from the math corner and I'm doing physics as well, but we all have our own languages and you have to overcome barriers um, collaborating, which have been some of my pleasant uh, interactions with, with colleagues. But she has been really someone who has brought ma rigor rigorous math into these questions. Um, she has been able to bond and to uh, build bridges in the community. That's something I think we can take her again as an example. So something really very interesting. And um, Thibault mentioned that. So Yvonne's uh, father had helped Jewish students escape uh, uh, during the, the Nazi regime and the Vichy regime in the South. So go to Spain and from there uh, uh, over to the US or to some free country. So I think it's been always inspiring talking to Yvonne about all of her family life, as Genevieve said, and, and her experiences. And she's always made clear that family and friends are a central part of her life. So I, I think I... As Sergio and Thibault and uh, everybody said, I it's really I admire uh, Yvonne for many of of of, of these things that he, she has done in her life. So, yeah, thank you. I don't see any more questions. I would just like to bring up that uh, Stan Deser, who passed away recently, has also a similar story of, uh, you know. Uh, having to move under duress uh, at, at the same time. And uh, it's just an interesting coincidence, I would say, or maybe not. But okay, thank you so much for being here for this event. Um, Norma, uh, is that a raised hand? Yes, please. Yes, uh, uh, thank you so much. And uh, hello to everybody. And uh, just uh, uh, being uh, in Paris and uh, from the 70s and when Yvonne and um, André uh, were the professors at Collège de France who welcomed us among uh, the students or, or postdoc students uh, like me and then after senior uh, researcher, permanent researchers. And uh, I would like to, um, to um, support the testimonies, scientific and um, personal, about uh, Yvonne. I had the pleasure to have uh, discussed uh, science and, uh, and uh, life with her in the many meetings at, uh, at Paris and also international, uh, in the international meetings, among them the general relativity and gravitation meetings, but many others, and also in South America, Yvonne and Hita Liman on, on a school. Yvonne was also uh, an open uh, traveler. I mean, she 
Uh, she traveled uh, a lot, and I found that also uh, very interesting and for her uh, open, uh, open mind. So um, even, I mean, if I, then after I, I had my own more quantum uh, version of uh, gravitation, but uh, also was the possibility to meet, I'm on, uh, Steinlein Desser, but many, many others uh, there at Collège de France with uh, Yvonne and, uh, and André. So it's a testimony of that time, which I think is, is good to have from first hand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Norm. Um, would anyone else like to contribute? If not, I would say that uh, I'll thank again all of our speakers today, and I will post a recording of this meeting to YouTube later, and together with David, we will let you know when it's online. Thank you so much, and see you at the next event. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.